you, Ryan. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me to come and speak to you today. And thank you very much also to the sponsors, ABS Global, uh, for bringing me here. Um, interestingly, do never, never ever go on an international tour when you've just had major dental work done, because I am really having to struggle to talk through these teeth. So I'll try and go as slowly as possible. And I've been practicing saying supercalifragilisticexpialidocious all week to try and get the diction correct. So what I'd like to do today is just give you a little bit of, and share some of our experiences with, one, with longevity in the UK and also sort of explain what we've done with Thai Merit. Yeah. I think Margie's going to do the slides. <laughs> okay, UK market's perspective, let's start here. Um, over the last few years, margins in the UK have been really, really tight. And when I say really tight, we try to get some perspective of this. And, you know, many average producers were making a couple of pennies a litre, which is the equivalent in the US, I think, of around about sort of uh, 50 uh, cents per 100 weight. Now, a lot of producers are actually losing money over the last two years, so I've had to kind of hang in there. But it's been a really, really tough last few years. Um, one of the key issues for us is labour on farm at the moment. It's a big, big issue. Um, youngsters aren't very keen to come back to the... 4 a.m. lifestyle, you know, and going off to university and doing other things. So farmers are really, really struggling with labour on farm particularly. This, uh, this cultural aspect, this disease aspect is a big one. Supermarkets are putting a large, large amount of pressure on our producers and so are consumers. Uh, one particular um, issue at the moment is, is dairy cow lameness that they're, they're targeting. So farmers are having to sort of try and, uh, and adapt and do things about that. Um, but also with the Thank you, much. With the introduction of technology, larger herds are having to take, in, take on board new management software packages, particularly as labor has been reduced. So we're seeing you know, increased management from uh, software and also uh, from, from the web. But this is, this is the important thing. Genetically, you know, we demand a totally different type of cow than we did certainly 10, 10 years ago. She's got to be all these things in this list. She's got to be adaptable. She has to be long-living and welfare-friendly, particularly for our consumers. Environmentally sustainable is a big one for us, you know, with this environmental impact. Efficient, but for me, profitable is probably the most important thing on that slide. So what's happened to um, the dairy cow uh, uh, herd size? Well, this little group here, this 130 to 159 cows per herd, this is our average herd size going along here. This used to be here about two years ago. Herd sizes are on the increase a big time. They've increased in the last couple of years by average of 80 cows per herd. But the growth area is here in this 300 plus cow herds. Labor's getting less, herds are getting bigger. So these cows are going to have to be a lot, lot easier to manage. This is a picture of a typical sort of UK cow barn. Now you might think these, these cubicles are quite small. They are on the average farm. There are bigger cubicles on bigger farms. But the investment in increasing this cubicle size is extremely expensive, particularly with, with the margins that we've been on. The big thing for UK producers is they cannot afford to change the system to suit the cow. The cow's getting bigger. Okay, we've got to make sure that we are picking and selecting and developing that cow to suit the system. It's a really important thing for UK producers. Okay, so what's happening? This is milk yield over time. We've got to the 1989, 1998 there, we're up to 2000 here. Uh, the grey bars are actually pedigree cows, and yellow bars are the, the national average in the UK. This, this trend is not, is not unique to the UK. It's typical throughout the world, as it is in, in the US. Our average herd um, yield per cow at the moment is around sort of uh, between sort of 8,700 8, litres. In your terms, that's about 19,000 pounds of milk. Now, that might not seem a lot, but in the UK, um, we're very, very heavily focused in our payment system on components. So we're pumping out sort of 19,000 kilos at an average of between 39 to 4% butter fat. So components are a big aspect. So that's why this yield is sort of not, not as high as you probably expect to see in the US. We've seen similar trends to this with somatic cell count rises over the past few years. And also with increasing yield, there's been increasing carving interval. And again, that's not unique to the UK and there's trends that we've seen in the US and worldwide. So what's happening to our longevity in the UK? You might think, well, you know, could be going down. This graph is actually the genetic trend for longevity in the UK. It's been rising. It's going up. We're at an average of about 3.5 lactations per cow at the moment. So, you know, it's not all bad news. Interesting blip here. You might be wondering what on earth that sort of peak is. 
you remember sort of 1996 is coincide with, that's when we had the BSE crisis. And what happened here is a lot of cool cows, uh, the market for cool cows dropped, went out of the market, so these cows had to be kept on farm and kept around. But I think this interestingly just shows you how sensitive the data is to changes in the environment. And uh, that was quite a telling period for UK producers. Okay. So what's happening to some of our older cows? You know, here we've got a graph, we took some data and had a look at, at animals that have gone right up to parity 10. So these are 10th carvers, versus uh, uh, heifers just down here at 1. As you can see that as, as parity increases, milk yield increases to a peak of around 3rd to 4th lactation, and then starts to drop off as the cows get older and older. One of the things in the UK is, you know, do we want cows to, to continually to get older and older to the point where they're giving the same amount of milk as they did as a heifer? What we'd like to do in the UK is move that 3.5 lactations just up a little bit around this fourth, fifth lactation so that these cows are paying you back for that big investment you made as heifers and heifer rearing and replacement rate. At the same time, this is somatic cell count over, over parity. So as cows are getting older, they're increasing somatic cell count. Now, this might not mean an awful lot to you guys here in the US because I understand that your threshold's around about, is it 600,000 cells? In the UK... Um, we have a threshold between 150 and 200,000 cells, after which the farmers will be heavily financially penalised uh, in their milk check. So that sort of 50 cents per hundred weight can be very, very easily lost if these cell counts rise. So cell counts are a major, major part of our breeding goal. Okay. So the UK has a number of other issues that it wishes to address, and these aren't unique to us too. Extreme angularity. As we've grown in milk yield, angularity is as follows as a consequence. You breed for one, you get another. It's like a bog-off deal. Buy one, get one free. My fiancé says to me, underneath this bleached hair is actually red hair, and I've got freckles. And my fiancé is convinced that these are very highly correlated with bad temper. I'm not so sure. <laughs> okay, at the same time as we've been getting angularity, cows have been getting bigger. You know, you're getting buy one, you get one free. Stature's increased in the UK, and so has body depth. But these are actually negatively correlated with lifespan. Angularity is negatively correlated with lifespan, you call productive life, and also fertility. So in the UK, what have we done? Well, we've put a lot less emphasis on these traits. We tried to reduce the emphasis on, on these, particularly these three key body traits, and look for a balance. Okay, Marge. So our national type merit index now um, has been redeveloped completely to reflect longevity and to create this balance of functionality and longevity, which is really, really important. We've put lots of emphasis on, on mammary and legs and feet. At the same time as breeding for these, you are still getting... What's that? Oh, excellent. Good pointer. You are still getting um, increases in these other traits because of the correlation between mammary and increasing milk yield or the texture, that type of thing. So you are still seeing. But it doesn't mean that you're breeding smaller cows. Because of the correlation between these traits and these traits here, we aren't going to be breeding smaller cows. We're just trying to curb that very, very extreme uh, linear that we're seeing. Okay. So our philosophy is very simple. We keep going, Marge, this fills up. Um, our philosophy is very, very simple. Longevity and functionality and also efficiency and profitability need to be balanced. As long as you need to get, this cow needs to last as long as you need it to in your herd. And you need to be able to choose to cull her, that she does not cull herself, that she lasts as long as you want it to last. And during that time, she's got to produce efficiently to suit your system and suit your needs. So that's kind of the simple philosophy. So I've told you a little about what we're doing, what are these cows likely to look like. So what I did was took some data from all the classified animals in 1999, give them a chance to, to last. And what we did was take these, these scores, these linear scores, if you're familiar with the way that classification is, is arranged, scores are, are taken on a linear scale between two extremes. And I've just picked out some um, few key traits which I thought you might be interested in. Certainly it's, it's traits we're interested in in the UK. This is, this is the chest width, measured between the two front legs. Very, very simple. There's your very narrow chest width. There's your very, very wide chest width. And on average, how many lactations these cows actually last. This is a cracking example of an intermediate optimum trait. You can see that the animals with a bang on five, they don't want to be wide as a house. Dairy strength is a big word in the UK at the moment. Great, you know, you want strength through the front end and heart room. You certainly do not want them too wide. That's increasing body weight. And likewise, you don't want them too narrow. Okay. 
Another trait is, is body depth. Again, this is another one taught within dairy strength. Again, there's, there's some sort of optimal, but it's certainly not at either extremes. You get into this realm, you're getting a really heavy cow, you're putting stress on legs and feet, life weight's going up. But likewise, you don't want anything too shallow. Intakes are very important. Okay, here's angularity, the interesting one. You'd expect, you know, probably for it to be less. We're putting less emphasis on it, remember. But what we're saying is we don't want it to either of these extremes. If you actually take animals up here, they're probably so extreme and milking so hard that this is where you're getting issues with your fertility, not getting those cows back in calf, calving intervals or stretching. Down here, she's giving you nothing. We don't want to breed the milk out of the cows. So that's very important. What we're looking for is to target the breeding goal in this area to try and maximize longevity. Okay, thanks so much. So here we're going to have a look at some other traits, because I think other traits are pretty important. We've got rear udder height, thanks Marge, that's pretty linear. And here's udder depth, but the, the correlation between these two is, is massive. You breed for one, you're getting the other. You know, nice, tight, high rear udders, you're getting, you're getting udder depth that's a lot shallower. And as you can see here, you know, you don't want animals that have too, too tight and, and, uh, and shallow depth in the udder, because then you're losing the milking ability, but you do want really good, tight udders. Here's one that interests me, four other attachment. This is one of the highest correlated traits to longevity in the UK as a predictor. But again, down here back at nine, as soon as you get a, a, an udder that's far, far too attached to the wall, you're losing that texture, you're losing the milking ability. And this is only common sense. So milking cows, as I have done in the past and come from a dairy farm, these graphs make sense to me. Okay. This is other support. You guys will call this udder cleft probably. And um, this is the tight term. Um, tight other cleft between the, between the other, cent central ligament. Up here makes sense to me too, because whilst you want a good strongly attached udder, you don't want them too strong, because what you end up is those back teeth starting to cross, and that creates an absolute havoc if you're in the parlour and you've got 500 cows to get through. So, you know, these graphs do make sense phenotypically and make sense for our breeding goal too. I'm going to show you a couple of, um, a couple of traits now that you might not have seen before. Particularly, um, this, this one here is actually locomotion. Now, this is a trait that was originally unique to the UK. It's actually measured when the cow um, is in motion, and it features extremely strongly in our type, both type and profit indexes, and is very, very highly correlated to longevity. And it's an excellent predictor of longevity. You can see it's almost linear fashion. Um, another key trait is used in, in the UK, and especially in our National Fertility Index, is condition score. I don't know if you guys are using this over here quite a lot, but condition score for us is a very important trait. Um, and this graph, again, just like chest width, really demonstrates the value of an intermediate optimum. You know, you don't want a cow that's really, really fat looking after herself and not looking after you. But likewise, an animal that's milking off its back continuously, it's very, very difficult to get in calf. Okay. So, here's a summary. Hopefully we've kept 10 minutes. Um, the UK... The breeding system really and, and the index system in the UK has had to adapt and change and meet the needs of our producers particularly and also we think producers worldwide. We've been at huge risk of our producers becoming disillusioned with Holstein cattle. These are the big ones. Farm sizes are getting bigger, average herd sizes are getting bigger and this lab labour on farm is, is a big, big issue. We have to make these cows easy to manage and long lasting as long as we want them to last. They're demanding this efficiency and value for money. They don't want to be paying over the odds for this, and they want to be able to access this information easily. And our job in the UK is to make sure, and I think for everyone's job worldwide, to make sure that Holsteins can deliver this, importantly. Our classification system has changed considerably to follow this philosophy, particularly, and our philosophy generally is following function and balanced cows, of a balance of function and certainly not following fashion. Thank you very much for your time.